Hey everybody, welcome to Song and Sword Online Church. We're so glad you've joined us as we are here every Sunday preaching the Word of God, uh, singing a song of grace, and yielding the sword of truth. That's what we do here at Song and Sword. If you're brand new, we'd like to get to know you. Go to our website, songandsword.com. There's all kinds of stuff you can do there. You, you can uh, get on our uh, social media sites, Song and Sword, and uh, you can catch a daily devotion. Give us an hour a week, and we think it'll change your life. Uh, today, I want to encourage you to go to songandsword.com and uh, sign up for the June 25th event. Uh, we're going to hold it at Normal Theater. It's a live event, and uh, already uh, half of the, uh, the tickets are already gone. So uh, get on there, make sure you sign up, and uh, we hope to see you there live. Um, also, uh, I would like to tell you that um, you can buy swag, song and sword t-shirts and stuff like that on our website. So we hope you will check that out. We love you and uh, glad that you guys are partnering with us. Uh, a couple of things here. First of all, you'll see that communion today, I've got a little bit different because I've got some bread that I can tear. Hopefully that'll make sense later as we get into the sermon. And, uh, but get some supplies, get your family around. At the end of the sermon, we'll take communion together. And finally, uh, last but not least, I want to say happy Memorial Day. Uh, many of you have um, friends and family members who have paid the ultimate sacrifice to defend their country. And this is Memorial Day weekend. We honor them and we thank you and them for their service. Uh, well, today we're going to get into the Word of God at um, Acts chapter 2, starting with verse 42. And we're going to learn about the church. Now, when you say church, uh, I've been in church for 38 years as a pastor. A lot of different churches, a lot of different ministry programs. And what I've found is that Christians can become very passionate about a lot of things that involve church and Christians. Uh, I, I've been involved when I was a kid in puppet ministry, drama ministry. There's always a sewing circle of some sort that's making quilts for people who are shut-ins. I've uh, been a part of the Sons of Thunder Christian motorcycle ministry, sign language ministries for the deaf and the hearing impaired, bus ministry to pick up kids. I actually knew one church that had a men's wild game ministry where guys gather together to eat the stuff that they've killed in their hunts. And uh, they just fellowship over that. You like the beach? You can do a beach outreach ministry. Food pantry, clown ministry, distance running ministry, Tuesday night calling, movie ministry. You can be an anti-porn ministry, an anti-abortion ministry. You can go camping and call it ministry, bowling ministry, cricket ministry, basketball ministry. Yes, yoga, Zumba, aerobics, and weightlifting. All ministries you can probably get involved in. And the Women's Missionary Society is just another one that's very old, women dedicated to worldwide missions. I've seen all of these and more, that's just the tip of the iceberg, not to mention the usuals, men's ministry, women's ministry, discipleship, married ministry, singles ministry, single again ministry, college age ministry, young adult ministry, you get the idea. I could go on and on and on because literally, if you can think of a way to do ministry, it's there in the church. So I, after what I've just listed, if you're a young adult man who likes to hunt and clown around and go bowling, you've been divorced, but you want to grow in your faith and, and you're interested in world missions, you could join eight ministries in most churches right now. Here's the question. Do we need all that stuff? Is it too much? Um, or can we narrow church down to four simple things? That's what we're going to see today when we find out for, in Acts chapter 2, when the first church started, the first church really dedicated itself. That's why we've called this sermon Devoted Church, devoted itself to four things. Let's get in the Word today, and let's read this together, and, um, and then I'll share uh, with you what God's um, going to share with us today. Uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Here's the Word of the Lord. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and the fellowship, and the breaking of bread, and the prayers, and all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together, and they had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Let's ask the Lord to speak to us today through His Word. God, we believe that your, your written Word, the Bible, is alive and it's active. It's like a sharp sword that gets down deep. And so I'm asking now for thousands of viewers and listeners uh, here in central Illinois and around the world through Song and Sword, would you speak to us, God? Don't let this just be a sermon. Uh, make it personal. Get deep into our hearts. Make us the kind of church that's devoted to the things that matter. 
And I just pray that you would bless me with the words by your Holy Spirit. Inspire me now so that I can inspire others. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Well, uh, the church began to, with a devotion to four simple things. That's it. Now, I want to give us a disclaimer here because if you were involved in one of the ministries that I mentioned earlier, you might be thinking, well, what's wrong with my ministry? Well, the ministries mentioned above, by the way, I mentioned over 45 of them, can be very good expressions of Christian faith. But church, like all organizations, has a tendency to get complicated. And, and every once in a while, we just need to get back to the basics and focus on what really matters. And there's nothing better to get back to the basics than to go to the Word of God and go, what did they do when the church first started? And so, that's where we're going to go today. Church is simple when it's devoted to four things. And I believe that a devoted church is what the world needs right now. So let's just look at this word devoted. Here's the first point there in your outlines if you're following along. A devoted church is about four simple things. Okay, let's look at that word devoted in verse 42. They devoted themselves. The word is a Greek word that literally means to adhere to, uh, to, to, to almost glue yourself to. They were completely stuck to this idea, these four things. They were devoted. And the part of speech means that they did it over and over and over again. In other words, the church was continually sticking to four things. And here is what the first, a devoted church looked like in the first century. First, a devoted church is about teaching. It says there in verse 42, the very first thing, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Peter and those guys that we've been introduced to through all Jesus' life, the twelve. And they had a very specific calling on their lives. They were men that Jesus had personally trained called them and trained them. I, I like to see it this way. They had been in Jesus University for three years. And so in Matthew 28, 20, when he gives us that great commission, he says to them, listen, I want you to go into all the world and teach them everything I've commanded you. And here we are at the first day of the church. 3,000 people have joined the church, have been baptized, and have been saved. And now they need to learn about Jesus and his way. So the church was devoted to the teaching of these apostles. Now, where did this teaching uh, take place? Likely on the southern steps. You can Google this. You can look anywhere you want to. I'm going to show you a picture in just a minute. The southern steps are the steps from the first century that went up to the temple complex from the lower city of David to the temple that Solomon built. And this is the place where the rabbis in the first century, Gamaliel and Hillel and Shammai and those guys, taught it's where Jesus likely taught, and I believe it's probably where these apostles taught day by day. Look what it says in verse 46. They attended the temple day by day. So where did this teaching take place? On these southern steps, very likely. Uh, and if, if you're wondering, could they fit thousands or hundreds of people on these southern steps? The, abs the answer is absolutely yes. You know, look at this picture that I uh, took, or my wife took last time we were there. I'm teaching a group of about 60 people on these steps. So you can see the length and the breadth and the height of this. Easily, you could, you could fit thousands of people. If one apostle was talking, they could probably hear him. If 12 guys were teaching, they could have had pockets of hundreds teaching the Word of God. The point is that the church should be about teaching. It's one of the four devotions of the church. And this word um, didache in the, in the Greek language uh, indicates a formal teaching. Guys, there is no way to be a follower of Jesus Christ without having people teach you the way to follow Jesus Christ. And it's a constant learning experience. I tell people this all the time. I've studied the Bible my whole life. I've studied it professionally for 38 years. I still am learning about the Jesus way. Teaching will always be a part of the church. And unlike, unlike the early church, what we have going for us is that we have the Bible. You understand it this way. Um, the Old Testament, Jesus came along and said, hey, everything in the Old Testament, Moses, the prophets, the Psalms, they all point to me. He taught the disciples that. Then the disciples taught in the early church and they wrote letters to the churches so that all the instruction of Jesus, Old Testament, New Testament, we have in the written word of God, the Bible. We really have a great a great advantage. However, speaking gifts are still a part of the church. The church, uh, God has always used people 
to use gifts. So we have like Ephesians 4 tells us that apostles and prophets, evangelists and shepherds and teachers, they do what they do. Look, and this is very important, Ephesians 4, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. This is the prayer of song and sword. We want to be a ministry that teaches and preaches the word of Jesus Christ in a way that equips saints for the work of ministry. And it builds up the body of Jesus Christ. And hopefully you're getting a part of that today. The second uh, part of the devotion of the church was not just teaching, but it was about fellowship. You see that word there. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship. Now, when I think of fellowship, and if you're an old school church person like me, you probably think immediately of the fellowship hall. When I think of fellowship, because of my upbringing in the church, I think of all kinds of pies and casseroles and fried chicken and whatever anybody wanted to bring into what we used to call a potluck or a pitch and dinner. I never liked the word potluck because you're lucky if you get something good out of this pot. But uh, the whole point is, is that fellowship hall is often associated with fellowship, but it's actually something else that I'm going to share with you in just a moment. The truth is the word fellowship the word koinonia actually has to do with a partnership. Think of koinonia and fellowship as two business partners who start a business together and they go in financially and work-wise and investment. Think of it as a husband and wife. Koinonia are people coming together and saying, we're in this together, we're partners in this together. And fellowship in the church means that all of us are completely invested in Jesus and each other. We're in this together. This means that among other things, we meet other people's needs. Look at what was happening in verse 44. One of the great things about the church and fellowship is, if we're in this together, kind of the old three musketeers, one for all and all for one, if that's, if that's our attitude, then when one of us has a need, everybody else helps meet that need. Verse 44, all who believed were together had everything in common, and they were selling their possessions and belonging and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. That word common in verse 44, if you want to circle, is a root of the word fellowship. Again, we have stuff in common. And, and our commonality in Jesus Christ because we've been saved by Him means that now I'm in fellowship with Him, we're partners, and I'm in fellowship with you because we're in this together. This is why they were selling their lands and stuff. You, I can't, just trying to think of like first century garage sales, were they the same as ours? Where people walking up and go, hey, how much for those sandals? Two shekels. I'll give you one shekel for those sandals, not a, a shekel more. I don't know if they had those kind of things going on, but they were selling their lands. They were selling their stuff. They were giving them all away to people who needed. Now, this was a, a financial investment for sure. You can't talk about koinonia. You can't talk about fellowship in the first century without thinking of financial investment. And I'm going to talk about this in a couple of weeks when we talk about a generous church. But the reality is there's no way to do church without investment of time and effort and, yes, money. If you see those uh, scriptures that are listed there, uh, they have to do with um, uh, people giving gifts for the good of other Christians throughout the world. The first church put their money where their mouth is. Now, I want to stop here and just get really personal and say thank you from the bottom of my heart for those of us at Song and Sword who are doing this ministry. God's calling us to preach Jesus with the song of grace and the sword of truth. And nearly half of our 200 goal of getting partners has been met. That means that almost 100 of you have said, we want to be in fellowship with you. Everything that God does in the name of song and sword, you are partners with that because of your devotion. Not only your time and your talents, but your money. And if you want to uh, give to us, you can become a partner, monthly partner for $5, $25, any amount. Says, we want a fellowship with you in this ministry that God has called you to. So the church is devoted to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, and then it's also devoted to breaking of bread, to the breaking of bread. If fellowship is associated with eating together, and it was, the first church ate together a lot. They were devoted to eating together. Look in verse 46 again. How often did they eat together? How often did they get together to have pitch-in dinners and hang out with other Christians eating? Verse 46, day by day they attended the temple and they received their food with glad and generous hearts in their homes, breaking bread in their homes. Now, uh, the, the, the question is, what was this devotion? What, what exactly is breaking of bread? Is it communion? Well, Jesus broke the bread when he said, this is my body at the first communion. 
The breaking of bread in Acts 20, uh, verse 7, when they're there in Troas, seems to be the church coming together to break bread. So breaking bread was definitely the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, which we'll celebrate here in just a moment. Of course, Paul's long discussion about communion uh, in the church of Corinth in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 is all about communion, celebrating the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And we'll celebrate that together at the end of the sermon. But I want to show you something. On the other hand, breaking of bread, as we read in verse 46, is this. Literally, every Jewish meal began with the Jewish host, whoever is hosting, would pick up the bread and they would break it and they would lift it to heaven and they would pray a prayer of blessing over it. And that is what they were doing as well. They were literally sharing life together. They were doing this with glad and sincere hearts. So when you eat together, here's what happens. You learn to listen. You learn to laugh. You learn to love. You learn to hear the needs of other people, and then you get to respond to those needs and that conversation. Guys, there's nothing better than sitting around with a bunch of Christians, uh, eating and drinking, laughing and sharing life together. I believe this breaking of bread that we read about here in the first church, they were devoted to breaking bread, was not just communion or not just eating together, it was both. And we have historical evidence that the early church got together to eat and in the middle of that meal, just like Jesus did at Passover, they celebrated the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. And uh, so recently, when Sarah and I uh, left the church that we've been at for 27 years, the first thing that we thought about is, who, who are we going to fellowship with? Who are we going to break bread with? Who are we going to share life together with? And praise God, some of our small group and, and some friends and some people just gathered around, and we have a community every week where we can share the body and blood of Jesus Christ together but we also have eaten together and laughed together, and it's been a real, real joy to us. The Easter sunrise service, the May 21st event last week, the upcoming June 25, it's a chance for us to get together. What's the really super sacred stuff we do? Yeah, some donuts and some muffins and some coffee, but in the midst of that, we're being like the first church, devoted to teaching, devoted to fellowship, devoted to breaking bread, and then we come to the last one, the prayers. I want you to notice there, and it says it, it translates it the right from the Greek language. There's an article there, the prayers. Not just prayer, of course the church was dedicated and still is dedicated to prayer, but the actual language of the Greek could indicate a set time for prayer, as we'll talk about in next week's sermon, and, or it could just be set prayers, like prayers that you and I pray all the time, like, Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We say these set prayers at set times. We pray before bed. We pray when we wake up, before meals. They were doing the same thing. But I also believe that they were praying at the time of prayers in their Jewish faith. You see, they didn't look at their Jewish faith and go, oh, now that Jesus is here, we don't have to do the prayer times at the temple anymore. Remember, I want you to see again, verse 46, day by day they attended the temple together. And there were times of prayer in the temple that they just by their Jewish faith kept going to pray. So when we talk about the prayers, they're obviously going to these prayer times, and, um, and we find that they were de dedicated to these prayer times. But they were also dedicated to prayer in general. In Acts chapter 1, verse 14, if you have your Bibles, you can flip back, and you can see that um, all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer. Same word we're talking about today. The first church of 120 before the Holy Spirit came, they were devoted to praying together. See, guys, here's the deal. The story of the early church and the story of the church now is when guidance was needed, they prayed. When strength was needed, they prayed. When they were arrested, they prayed. When they were beaten, scattered, scared, shut out of the marketplace, they prayed. They prayed for healing. They prayed for one another. They prayed for their kids. They prayed for open doors for the gospel. They prayed for each other. They prayed for the Lord to give them the strength. They prayed for their enemies. You cannot do church without being dedicated to prayer. And these are the four. The church can have many programs, services, outreaches, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, until you can think of nothing else. But ultimately, church is this simple. I want you to hear this. This is the church that the world needs now. This, this devoted church to four things, teaching, fellowship, breaking bread, and the prayers. And this, this church, what I want to show in our remaining time together today, is exactly what the, church, the world needs. 
A devoted church meets four world needs. The first one is this. The world needs the awe of the church. See, when you go to church, when you're involved in a community that has the teaching of Jesus and fellowship and breaking of bread and prayers, guess what? Awe happens. Miracles happen. We find in this early church, the same apostles who were doing the teaching were also wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, verse 43. See, what happens when you devote yourself to God in these four things, God shows up and works in an incredible way. And here's what I believe that the world needs. See, we live in a world where too much technology and too much knowledge and too many conveniences have made us unimpressed and bored. The world needs awe. The world needs miracles. The world needs signs and wonders. And the church is the only place in the whole world, the only institution in the world that still believes in, prays for, and experiences miraculous stuff. The second thing the world needs uh, is the generosity of the church. We live in a selfish and self-centered world. People invest for themselves, pay money for things that benefit them and their kids. They give to things they care about. Usually when somebody transacts money, it's for them. But the church developed the generosity. You see, only the church community preaches that money ultimately is not mine to keep. And the needs of others are more important to mine. You see the switch? If I take the money that I have in my hand, my bank account, my purse, my wallet, and I say, this is God's, and I'm just looking around going, it's not about me, who needs this? And when I start looking at other people and saying, how can I use my resources to meet the needs of others? That's generosity. And in a selfish world, I think that shows more than ever before. You see, the more we give, you would think, oh, so everybody in Christianity have to be poor and, and uh, scraping things together. No, what happens? And, and you're sad because all your money's gone. No, look what happens. In verse 44, they, they um, I'm sorry, in verse 46, they receive their food with glad and generous hearts. It's, it's more blessed to give than to receive. When you give, there's a generosity that happens that's good for the world and it's good for you as well. The, second, the third thing is the world needs the community and belonging of the church. About a month ago, the Surgeon General of the United States, Dr. Vivek Murthy, um, officially declared isolation and loneliness as an epidemic that is harming the physical, emotional, and spiritual health of Americans. Can you imagine that? We live in a time where I can email China, I can FaceTime India, I can call someone, uh, you know, text someone in Haiti. I'm connected to literally 7.5 billion people, and yet I can be isolated and lonely, and that's what's happening in this world. We are connected through technology, but not face-to-face. And this is yet another time when the Bible and science totally agrees. The doctor says isolation and loneliness are bad, and the Bible says it is not good for man to be alone. And he wants us to be together. I believe the church has an opportunity now in this time of isolation and loneliness to welcome people in and to be the place that says, hey, we're a fellowship. We break bread together. Doesn't matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done, you get to come in and be a part of what God's doing. Finally, the world needs the salvation only the church can offer. You see what's happening there? When a church devotes himself to teaching, fellowship, breaking bread and prayers, look what happens. The Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. Ultimately, church is about all these four things so that God can add to the number of people who are being saved. He paid a great price. He went to great lengths to come into the world through His Son, Jesus Christ, to love us, to die for us, to be buried, and to rise again to give us hope of eternal life. And if you need that hope today, I want you to call us, text prayer to that number on your screen and let us know you need to hear more about Jesus Christ because that's what the church is all about. This world needs saving. And the church that's devoted to these four things is the place where people are saved. God bless you guys and we look forward to seeing you again next week at Song and Sword. We'll go ahead and grab the emblems that you have for communion, whether you're at your home or your apartment with friends or family or just by yourself. And as I said earlier, I grabbed these pieces of bread because they were broken. And if you go to 1 Corinthians 11, I uh, described it in the sermon today. Uh, The Bible says that Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
Let's do it the way that Jesus did. Let's break his body and let's remember the sacrifice he made for us. And 1 Corinthians 11 says, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he blessed it. He said, this is the blood of my covenant shed for you. As often as you drink of it, remember me. Let's remember the body and the blood of Jesus Christ together. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your shed blood, your broken body. We celebrate it now as the first church did 2,000 years ago. In Christ's name, amen.